lead into what we're going to be talking about today, which is a paper you wrote about something called the problem of bad epistemic company. Uh, and, and this is something that's, that's pretty unexplored territory, but it's the flip side of something that I think a lot of people watching probably are not familiar with, some are, but, uh, but that at least academic philosophers have spent a lot of time talking and thinking about, which is the problem of epistemic peer disagreement. So I thought maybe we could ease into the bad epistemic company by talking about the epistemic peer disagreement. So what does that mean? Yeah, so I think that is a useful way to begin. So the problem of peer disagreement is put almost as simply as possible is just the problem that you face when you encounter somebody who's just as smart as you, just as informed as you, by your own lights, you regard them as uh, equal in those ways, but they disagree with you. And so that opens up a obvious question, are you wrong? How did you end up with different beliefs? Um, one of you has to be wrong in a case of true disagreement. And so kind of like the simple case that gets people going on this problem is like you imagine you calculate a tip at a restaurant uh, and your friend who you have no reason to think you're better at math than they are, they calculate the tip and they get a different number, but you were both going for 20% or whatever it is. Uh, you know, it's intuitive there that we would both want to double check our math and that kind of thing, but this problem really exists yeah. in the domains of belief, religion, politics, science, there's all kinds of domains where we encounter disagreement by people who, by our own lights, are just as informed and rational and um, clever as us. And so there's a whole literature of philosophers giving different versions of the problem, different ways of responding to it, um, and so on. Yeah. So in that tip case, uh, you know, I think most of us have the... Uh, conciliatory intuition about this. In other words, that the fact that your friend who, you know, is not obviously worse at math than you or anything like that got a different number when you were calculating it gives you at least some reason to be worried that you might be wrong. Not necessarily a decisive reason to think you are wrong, but like enough of a reason to double check your figures and say, oh wait, did I do something? Uh, and that's that's kind of a, at least a you know simple model for how to think about, you know, bigger disagreements about uh, about more important things, and you know, one of the best ways that I've heard to to kind of get into why that, you know, like why it seems rational to think that that's at least some reason to think that you got something wrong, that somebody who seems to be just as smart as you, just as well informed with you as you, just as good at you know. And, and reasoning and all that stuff uh, came to a different conclusion. I think Roy Sorensen said this that the uh, like, you know, if you're if you're doing it with like if you're doing the calculation with your calculator and like you, know, you see the other person put it in and you put it into your calculator, you wouldn't think, well, this one is this calculator is mine, so therefore I believe that it got it right, you know, because it's mine, and, you know, like that that would just seem like a total non sequitur. But when it's, well, this brain is mine, you know, then we think it does. And, you know, there's an obvious question there about why that this analogy. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And so, like, one way of thinking about it is that there's this very, like, perspectival kind of proprietary um, thing going on where, you know, do you have reason to kind of favor your own, your own perspective, you know? Um, other, like, another kind of aspect of the problem that's interesting is how the, the subject matter seems to matter. So like, let's say you and I are both remembering somebody we knew in common, which, you know, we're not having this conversation, but we probably do know a lot of people in common in philosophy. And we like, I remember them being like very tall and you remember them being like not very tall. We might actually literally meet in the middle and think like, oh, maybe like, I thought the person was a little taller than they really were. And you might think I thought they were a little shorter. We don't usually do that with like, something like the the evidence for the existence of God. So right. suppose I think the, the evidence is decisive and you think the evidence is like terrible. There's practically speaking negligible evidence. We don't typically decide, well, the evidence must be so-so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you know, so there, there are domains where we kind of meet in the middle. There's domains where like with the tip case, it wouldn't really make that much sense to meet in the middle, even though you could quantitatively. Yeah, you could, but that's not what you would, that's not like, that's not what it seems intuitive to do in that case. And, but, and it's, and, and it certainly seems like, I mean, there, and there is an interest in tension here because I think a lot of people who are atheists or agnostics uh, think that there's a version of this that like gives you a pretty strong reason to, to doubt the claims of any particular religion, which, you know, like, I, I mean, in its typical form goes like, okay, you know, um, you know, you you believe the you know claims of Judaism, but come on, if you were born in rural India, you know you believe the, the claims of Hinduism. It's just you know pure happenstance, and 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 there's nothing about. Um, and even if uh, I mean I don't you know even if it were the case that like there are particular arguments that that moved you. You know, we we sort of think, yeah, but realistically, right? It's it's not that you know, it's not that you're much better at reasoning, you know, than, than people who 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 grew up in, in this other religious tradition. It's it's just that like you got access to the best versions of them at the right time. And I don't know, maybe this is not exactly the same problem, but it's certainly very closely in the neighborhood of it. Whereas though, like even a lot of people who would endorse that for, for religion. Like if they do academic philosophy, uh, I mean, if you if you take pure disagreement to be a decisive reason to abandon your beliefs and, and you do philosophy, you're just completely screwed. Yeah, and and that sort of uh, demographic argument. I mean, if you start looking at your political beliefs, your scientific beliefs, and so on, you know, there's a real a real puzzle there. Now that doesn't mean there's not disanalogies. Even so. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's a really fruitful area of inquiry, you know, um, and in many ways, just as a historical point in the literature, it's like there was sort of the problem of religious pluralism, it was sometimes called, like in philosophy of religion anthologies and stuff, that sort of predated the kind of general attention to the problem of disagreement. Um, as a kind of interesting side point, not to get too much on a tangent, but there is a kind of inverse argument for, the, for a kind of bare theism or supernaturalism called the... Um, uh, I don't want to embarrass myself. I think it's the, the consensus gentum argument or gentum argument, yeah. the consensus of the nations. And it's this argument that yeah, because that some kind of belief. Oh, what? Yeah, anyway, but yeah, is that like Cicero talks about that? Anyway, I might be, I might be just remembering this, but I definitely heard this. Please keep going. Yeah. I have a version of it there. Um, uh, there. There's a contemporary paper by Thomas Kelly, I think. Uh, he, um, the idea is like that. There's some there's something close to universality, not literally. Right. You can find atheists historically, but cross culturally, cross historically, there's you know it's very common to find some kind of belief in something resembling supernatural right. um, that we could characterize as supernaturalism, and the thought is that that's some evidence in favor of of there being such a thing. Um, you know, it's it's not a very strong argument, I think, by anyone's lights. Uh, but you know, one of the things you learn in philosophy is that it's it's okay sometimes to concede that something provides some evidence, <laughs> but, but you think it provides very little evidence. So who cares? Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I think that I think that's probably a stronger argument if, if you're a um, if you're a pagan because like you know, you've at least got the option of saying, oh, here's this list of gods. And here's this other nation's list of gods. And there's a lot of overlap. So like maybe these are all stem causally from like contact with the same the same group of gods. Uh, I, I think it gets more complicated, you know, when, when you're when you're doing both polytheism and, and monotheism. But yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a uh, uh, G. A. Cohen in one of the lectures, and he's got this little. Uh, uh, book the if you're an egalitarian how come you're so rich and uh, and he uh, he talks about I mean his main concern in that is with the political version of it you know because because he he grew up in a um, you know family in in uh, Montreal where he was like you know going to communist summer camp and stuff and it's like all right well I've I've rejected certain aspects of the like Stalinism you know that that I grew up with but like you know like core 
you know, intuitions about political philosophy are, are, are still definitely informed by this worldview that I picked up there. How much should I be bothered by that? Uh, and he uh, and he uses an example, right, though, that's like, okay, but, you know, when he was going to graduate school, he was trying to decide between uh, Harvard and Oxford and the reasons he went for Oxford had absolutely nothing to do with the philosophical views of anybody who taught there. Um, but like, he's fairly sure that if he'd gone to Harvard and studied with Quine, Quine would have convinced him that there was no analytic synthetic distinction. And, you know, because he went to Oxford, you know, he strongly believes that there is. And of course, you know, he read Quine eventually and all that, but like in an environment where he was primed to come to the other conclusion and, you know, was going to hear the very best versions of the other conclusion. And, you know, there's this, there is something, there is something a little bit troubling there. But in, but that's like the standard thing to worry about is, okay, what if people disagree with me who, um, who are bad people to disagree with me because like there's some reason to think they got it right. Uh, and in, um, and in your paper, what you're concerned with, the, the like interest in wrinkle is the opposite. Right? What, what if people agree with me who, who are bad people to, to agree with me because um, I have some reason to think that they would get this sort of thing wrong, right? So, so you start out, uh, you know, with a couple of, of, of quotes uh, with, and, it's, and it's a fun assortment because I, I think I probably and a lot of people have very different reactions to, to the first two of these. The first is from Noam Chomsky who I don't know, it was probably the Q&A or something and, and, and some like lunatic tanky is saying like, hey, the things that you say about the Soviet Union sound like the kind of thing that like the mainstream, you know, Reaganite corporate media says about it. And he says, yeah, whatever. I mean, why, why should I care about that? Right. That the, that I, if, if uh, you know, I'm right. I mean, I, I don't, I don't like, I don't really care that in this particular case, bad people, you know, come to the same conclusion for their own very different reasons. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, sympathetic to that. You know, I, I, I know I've just lost a chunk of the audience there, but I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, but then like this, the second one is Donald Trump, uh, who has just retweeted a quote from uh, Mussolini that he wasn't aware was a quote from Mussolini. And I uh, says, yeah, like, I mean, whatever, who cares? Right. I mean, like that's, it's a good, it's a good line. Uh, it's it's not it's not troubling to me that Mussolini was the one who said it, you know, because because he's not you know, he's not saying in the quote we should have fascism. Here's why he's just you know, it's sort of a poetic line about being a sheep or being a lion, and, you know, and, and it's like yeah, who cares? And I think a lot of people. This is one of the big points that you make at the beginning. Uh, instinctively, you know, we have very different reactions to the bad the bad company problem when it's people that we don't like having bad company on a point that we disagree with, uh, as opposed to views that seem right to us that are advocated by bad people. Yeah, and it's not only that we treat them a little bit differently, it's that like people act like it's a real, this is especially true in sort of public discourse, people act like it's a real decisive like own against someone. If you can point out like, aha, look, you're allied with the Heritage Foundation or something. Right. Whereas in the other direction, when somebody accuses you of a, of like having making some point that you know Charlie Kirk made or something, you don't just say, "Oh, well, you have to understand, I'm different from him in the following ways." You like don't even care. It's like you know, it's like that. You almost want to accuse them of making a kind of fallacy or you know a kind of guilt by association, a kind of informal type of fallacy. And so, yeah. So the sort of driving point of my paper is not that it's never okay to agree with people who you think are bad or that it's even often a decisive objection to point this out but that it's something that actually there are many reasons to take it seriously and it's a sort of much like the problem of disagreement in my view these cases are cases that are a kind of uh, almost call to reflection both reflection on the world and reflection on your, your your own self depending on the kind of case it is you have been watching a free public preview for a patron-exclusive episode of Give Them an Argument. 
uh, to get the rest of this episode, plus patron exclusive episodes every single Thursday, as well as patron exclusive post games after the regular show every Monday night, and a lot more. Head over to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. As a friend of mine used to put it, why be foolish? <laughs>